And as you're being seated, I know that we've had a lot going on this morning. A lot of exciting things, amen? Exciting things. It's good to be able to come to church and have lots of fun, exciting things happen. We're going to jump right into our sermon time this morning. If you have your Bibles, John chapter 2. Uh, we'll look at verses 1 through 12. And as we continue our study in John's account of the life, the earthly life of Jesus, we come today to a story of a time when Jesus attends a wedding feast. How many of you love weddings? Oh my goodness, this is terrible. How many of you love weddings? Yes, you do. We love weddings. There are fun times, exciting times, energetic times, times of hope and times of joy and times of expectation. There may be even those here right now who are planning for a wedding and are excited about that time. And we're all excited with you. And when you attend a wedding, you want things to go well. When you attend the wedding, you want it to be a joyful time and a fun time and an exciting time. And and you know what? You're even maybe okay with a little thing here or there going a little bit sideways or a little bit weird or a little bit funny because that gives you something fun to talk about. And the bride and groom can laugh about it years later and say, remember at our wedding when dot, 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 dot. And you have a great time, right? But generally, you want weddings to be good things and not tragic things. Jesus attends a wedding feast in John chapter 2, and it's a fun and a joyous and an exciting time. But something goes terribly wrong at the wedding, and at the feast, something goes bad. And, And as that thing goes bad, the groom especially, and the groom's family, and by extension, even the bride, are in danger of social disgrace. They're in danger of shame. They're in danger even of potential legal ramifications because something goes so wrong. And the sad thing is, is they don't even know it. They're partying and they're having a great time and they've had their wedding ceremony and now they're afterwards. They don't even know something terrible has happened. But there's good news. Guess who's on the guest list? Jesus is on the guest list. And when Jesus is on the guest list, good things are always going to happen. Amen? So Jesus is on the guest list, and he actually uses this opportunity to provide a solution to a problem that they didn't even know that they had, and really by extension to turn up the dimmer switch on his true identity, to start and begin with this very first miracle, this first sign that Jesus ever does in his life that we are aware of, the first miracle that Jesus does, he begins just to start to turn up the dimmer switch to show some people his identity. So we're going to look at John chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. In verses 1 through 5, we'll start out by identifying the problem. Verses 1 through 5, John chapter 2. He says, on the third day there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee. And and Cana is a place that's close to where Jesus had just been. um, And it's close to his hometown of Nazareth. And so it says they were in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of of Jesus was there. Perhaps she knew the people who were having the wedding, and and it seems as if because of her uh, understanding of the situation that happens and the tragedy that goes on, that apparently Mary was involved in in helping serve at this wedding, and she was part of of, uh, actually the wedding procession and things that were going on. In verse 2, Jesus was invited to the wedding with his disciples, probably five, maybe six of the disciples that we've heard about in the last few weeks' sermons were there with Jesus. Verse 3, when the wine ran out. And you might think, that's, that's not much of a tragedy. That's a tragedy in this culture. When the wine ran out in this culture, it was, it was as if joy had run out. I'll talk more about that in just a minute, but see, look at the rest of, of what happens. Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine. And Jesus said to her, and this is going to sound really strong, like Jesus, do we have to say it like this? Jesus said to her, woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour is not yet come. And his mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. So a few things about the problem. First of all, let's talk a little bit about weddings, okay? Weddings in that day were not too terribly different than weddings in our day in that they were seasons of joy and uh, occasions of excitement. But there were some differences. First of all, before you could get married in that culture, you had to go through what was called a betrothal period, right? And so the betrothal period was several months, maybe even up to a year, where the couple were, and I need all the adults to look at me so I can say it this way, but the couple were married, but they weren't married. 
Make sense? Right? They were legally married, but practically they, they hadn't consummated the marriage. They weren't married yet. They still lived separately. But this was a season of preparation. And the betrothal period was a time where the young man, he would have been pretty young, where he would have made sure that he was getting things into order, his house into order, and his job into order, and his life into order, and his things into order before he was ready to marry this young lady, that there was a season of preparation. And so the cool thing about the betrothal is it lasted, like I said, for several months of a period of, of preparation. And then when the day came, they had a pretty fun and cool way of going about it. When the day came, the, br- the groom would get his little entourage together at his house. And he would have his friends and probably his best man and some of his college buddies and some different people. And they would all get together and they would be at the, at the groom's house. And maybe they would sing a little bit or chant a little bit. But one of the things that, that apparently, in, in doing some historical background research on this, that they often did the weddings at night so that the boys could play with fire. They would light torches. Hey, I think we should do this. They would light torches, and they would take the procession through the streets of the town. The, the man, the, the groom, and all of his buddies, and they had torches with fire. I'm just throwing this out there. If anybody's going to get married anytime soon, right? torches and they would proceed through this through the town and they were on the way somewhere they were on the way to the bride's house and there was this it was a time where it was fun and everybody that was looking around saw this happening and they knew what was happening that so and so and so and so were getting ready to be married and they were excited and in a small town such as Cana and Galilee this would have started to arouse a lot of enjoyment and excitement and fun because This would have been a town where now the town knew that the whole town was going to be involved in this process. So the procession would come, and it would come to the door of the bride's house, and they'd knock on the door, and the the bride's dad would come to the door, and he'd say, pay up. I think that's what he would say. I'm pretty sure that he would make him pay some money. Anyway, then they would go into the bride's house, and they would have the, the actual ceremony. And we don't know a lot really even from history, about what the ceremony would look like. But they would have the ceremony, and then you know what would happen? After the ceremony, the whole crew would be together, and then they would all leave, and then they would all proceed back to the groom's house. And you know what? At the groom's house, what awaited them? A feast, a party, an incredible layout of food. And father of the who paid for it? Come on, everybody. The father of the who, Lauren? The father of the groom paid for it. It's biblical. Right there. Culture has corrupted marriage by making the father of the bride pay for everything. Amen? Amen. I have a verse and I'm ready to use it. I digress. Important for us to understand the background of what is going on because when you got back to the groom's house and everybody was there and most of the town, in a small town like this, probably all of the town was there And they were going to have this great feast. And what occurred at this feast was supposed to show the joy and the energy and the excitement and everything that was related to what was happening for this young couple. And oh, by the way, most receptions now last for what? Two, three, four, six hours, maybe tops until everybody's like, you know, tired of dancing and passed out. The feasts in this culture could last up to a week long. People are coming over and they're eating and then maybe they're heading back and getting some sleep and coming back and eating some more and going back and going to work and then coming back and eating some more. Or maybe they were just spending time there hanging out for up to a week excited. And guess who had to pay for all the food? And guess who had to pay for all the drink? And guess who had to make sure that everything was prepared and that everybody was happy and everything was going well throughout this whole time? This was a reflection on the groom. This is a reflection on the groom's preparation. His period of preparation in that whole betrothal period was reflected in how well this groom did at providing at this feast. And for many people, they would see how he provided at the feast as a reflection of how he would provide for her throughout the course of their life. Do you see how it begins to be tied very importantly to the fact that the wine suddenly runs out. This would have led to not just a little bit of embarrassment. We're we're not talking about the bride trips on the way up the aisle. We're not talking about one of the groomsmen has something funny to say at the, at the reception that maybe shouldn't have been said, right? 
what we're talking about is social disgrace. In a small town, everyone knows each other. Shame. This couple would have started out their marriage in shame. And people would have looked at this groom like, oh, we're not really sure. Is he really like, you know? And they would have always had an eye on this couple. Not to mention the fact that, that actually some, some other rabbinic writings outside of, of our New Testament actually say that there were potential legal ramifications. That if you came to that wedding and you had maybe already had a wedding for your family and, and you had come to that wedding and you had provided at your feast and that this person didn't provide at this feast, that there were some potential legal ramifications where you could actually file suit against this person and possibly have some, some financial compensation. And you begin to think about that and put all that together and you realize this is, this is actually quite catastrophic. That when the wine ran out, it wasn't just a small deal, well, we'll start you know, drinking lemonade. That there were great implications to what actually happened. And since I brought up lemonade, lemonade's closely related to uh, what we use in communion called grape juice. And so there's been some, you know, some different ideas behind what Jesus actually made here. Right? We're, we're kind of smiling, please, hopefully, a little bit. Okay? I'll say a couple of things about the word wine, not the word wine, because that's a whole study and the different words used for wine and all of those things. Many, many books have been written about it. If you'd like to do some study on that, feel free to do that. Tell me what you come up with. There were practical reasons in that culture for drinking wine. Uh, in, a, in a culture where refrig refrigeration did not exist, if you had a fruit drink or grape juice or something that you had uh, created off the vine, it would easily go bad. And so the process that they used in creating wine had some practical reasons behind it. And often they would dilute it one third, two-thirds water, one-third wine, or up to 10 times 10% water and 1% wine. Um, and they would dilute it for drinking purposes. And that was like just the practical reasons. But there were also celebratory reasons for drinking wine. And this was one of them. And what we hear about how Jesus makes wine in a few moments probably most likely indicates that, that uh, this was not just grape juice or highly diluted wine, uh, but this was actually good wine, maybe full strength or close to full strength wine that was made here that Jesus made. And the reason I bring that up is I, I've heard pastors use this particular passage and say, well, Jesus made wine so everyone should drink. Jesus made wine, so it's totally okay for everybody to drink at all times and in, in any occasion. Really what we don't want to do is take one passage like this, where Jesus does a, a miracle, and it's a miraculous kind of situation, and use that either to condone or condemn an action outright. What we do know is that the Bible nowhere condemns drinking, but it very ardently condemns drunkenness. We know that from Scripture. That, that's not a gray area. That's black and white, okay? But what we also know is that Jesus didn't make grape juice, that he made wine, and they were drinking it for celebratory purposes. And there were many reasons why that was important, but one of them is in that culture that wine was a symbol of joy, and this was a joyous occasion. And I want you to see that when the wine ran out, that there was a catastrophe at hand because of the fact of all of the things that I've already told you, and that they saw that maybe even as a symbol that the joy was, that the blessing was running out on this marriage before it ever even started. So, so how would Jesus respond to this? And you saw in, in verse 3, Mary makes a request and told him that the wine ran out, they have no more wine. In verse 4, Jesus said to her, Woman, some of you think, man, Jesus is kind of disrespectful, huh? Yeah, if I said that to my mom, I'd get smacked, right? So the, the term here is an interesting term, actually. Um, the NIV translates it as dear woman, which may be a little bit more respectful even than what was intended. When we hear the word woman, we think of it with 20th or 21st century uh, American connotations. It's very disrespectful. It was a term of respect, but it was also a term of distance. Jesus uses this term here. He uses this term when he's hanging on the cross and his mother is is in front of him, and, and John is there, and he says, woman, behold your son, son, behold your mother, and he turns care of his mother over to John, who wrote this book. He uses the same word there. He uses the same word of Mary Magdalene when she's at the tomb. This is a term of respect, kind of like what we would use when we say the word ma'am. 
And as you think about it, if I came to one of you ladies and, I, and you asked me something and I said, ma'am, that would be respectful, but it is also strong. If my mom came into this room and she asked me to do something and I said, ma'am, that doesn't concern me. Yeah, right? Your laughter tells the story. I'm being respectful, but there's also a distance. And what most scholars believe and what I believe is that right here, Jesus is signifying a change even in relationship with his own mother. We'll see through John's gospel and really through the gospels and Jesus's life that Mary had to come to Jesus, not just as her son, but as her savior. And in a story like this, when she comes with a request to Jesus, he's showing by this language that, that there's still respect there, but at the same time, there, there's a level of distance. That she doesn't just get to come to him because she's his mother, but she, she has to come to him because of who he really is. And so he says, ma'am, woman, what does this have to do with me? Or really, even more accurately, what does this have to do with me and you? Why are we getting into this? This isn't it about us. This is them. And then he says this word, my hour has not yet come. And if you trace that through John, and I won't go all the way through it today, but throughout his public ministry in John chapters 1 through 12, Jesus continually says, it's not my time. It's not my time. My hour has not yet come to be fully revealed. It's not my time yet to be fully revealed. And then in chapter 12 and chapter 13, especially as we go into his private ministry in chapter 13, you start to see that it's time for his hour. And then when he prays to the Father in John, I think it's chapter 15 or 17, I don't quite remember, um, and he says, Father, the hour has come. Glorify me. And that is when he's looking at going to the cross. That's so when he says, my hour is not yet come. What he's saying is, it's not yet time for me to be fully revealed. And so we see in those verses is that, that Jesus is present when this major problem arises. Jesus is there when this major issue comes up. But for some reason, he's seemingly reticent to act. And then the question is, what will he do? How's he going to respond? And so in verses 6 through 10, we're going to see how Jesus responds. Look at verse 6. Verse 6 says, Now there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of, of purification. I'll come back to that a little bit. Each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Now I need to push pause right here. And I need to come to this side of the room and talk to you guys about math problems. Okay? Those of you who are in school, look at me right here. Okay? If you're in high school, man, this better be easy for you. Don't blow this one. Okay? But some of you have to work on word problems in math, right? Math word problems. You love those? They're immensely practical for Bible study, and I'm going to prove it to you right now. There were six, write it down, six stone water jars, each hold, held between 20 and 30 gallons of water. Who can figure it out? What do we got there? Six water jars, 20 to 30 gallons. Roughly 100, we'll go with a, roughly 150, right? Roughly. And we're proud of them for being able to do that math thing, right? A little math question, right? Right. So you have, I'll make it easy for you. You have a lot of capacity, right? You're sitting there thinking 120, 150 gallons of uh, wine. That's going to that's gonna take care of a lot of people. I hope there were a lot of people at this party. Because if there's that much wine, and it was good wine, and there's not a lot of people there... Either this party is going to go for a long time or it's going to shut down real quick, one or the other, right? Verse 7 says, Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. And they filled them up. How far? Halfway? Two-thirds? They filled them all the way up to the brim. You, you see these six large stone pots, right? 20 to 30 gallons each. You can think about that. And they're overflowing with water. It's It's... Important in the text that you see that they're overflowing and that it's all water. Jesus wasn't pulling a fast one. This wasn't a trick. This just wasn't something that he did, you know, and added a bunch of water to a tiny bit of wine. That they were empty water pots. They were filled with water. And then he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. That would have been kind of like the guy who was in charge of making sure the right wine, the right amount of wine got to the right people, that the wrong people didn't get into the feast. The wine didn't run out. He was kind of master of ceremonies and that type of thing. Um, some have even called him the head caterer. And that's not really too far off from what this guy was. So they took it to him. Verse 9. When the master of the feast tasted the water, and, and what had become of the water? What had happened to it? Oh, wow. 
The water had now become wine. And he did not know where it came from. That's, that's important. He did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. The master of the feast called the bridegroom. The master of the feast had gotten the, maybe the little container of wine, took a drink, and all of a sudden, something's happened here. Calls the bridegroom. You can imagine, you know, you're the bridegroom and you're hanging out with your bride and you're eating and you're drinking and you're dancing and you're talking to people and you're doing your thing and the MC calls you over. That could be a really good time or that can be a really bad time, can it? Depending on the look on his face and depending on what he's getting ready to say, man, who knows what's getting ready to happen. So you can imagine the bridegroom as he's looking and, and the head caterer says, hey, I need to talk to you for a second. Who knows what the look on his face was, right? He says, come, I need, I need to talk to you. Bridegroom's like, oh, okay, I, you shouldn't be calling me right now, but okay, well, what's happening? In verse 10, the MC said to him, everyone serves the good wine first, and then when the people have, quote, drunk freely, then the poor wine. You know what he's saying there? This is a week-long party, and we probably can't serve the top-notch stuff the whole time. So what are we going to do? We're going to serve the good stuff first, and then when uh, some commentators are very conservative and when their, their, their palate isn't as discerning, okay? When their palate isn't as discerning, we'll slip in the poor stuff. We'll serve them, we'll serve them the diluted stuff, right? We'll pull out the, the not-so-vintage stuff, and they'll never even know, right? And he says, but you have kept the good wine until now. He says, we've been partying and we've been having a great time and we've been enjoying ourselves and we've been doing exactly what in our culture is acceptable and right and we've been celebrating this couple and everybody's happy and everybody's enjoying themselves and there's nothing in the text to indicate anything that would make us think that these people were drunk. So let's just, we'll just calm down on that one a little, right? But that they're enjoying themselves and they're having a good celebratory time. And the guy says, this is when we should start pulling out the stuff out of the back of the truck, right? That's not the great stuff. You know, we're pulling out the Costco stuff here and whatever. It's wine in a box and not in a bottle. Just saying, okay? I hope I didn't offend anyone with that one. If I did, email me later. Good. And what happens is now all of a sudden it looks like they've pulled out the good wine. It looks like they've pulled out. Hey, can you imagine the bridegroom? Can you imagine the groom? He's up there. He has no idea what's going on right? He has no idea what's happened. The MC doesn't know, the bridegroom doesn't. They don't know what's happened. If you're the bridegroom, what are you thinking? Oh, maybe they mixed them up. I had the Costco stuff, and I had the other stuff, and maybe they got them mixed up, and they served the poor stuff, and now everybody's like excited because it's really good stuff. But in any case, the bridegroom's like, okay, I feel pretty good about this, right? We're, we're doing all right. A couple of observations that I want to make before we get to verses 11 and 12 and really what is the crux of this story. A couple of observations, and the first one is this, is that Jesus in this story shows that Jesus bothers himself with people's real problems. This isn't the ultimate takeaway from this story, but this is a, a secondary plot line of this story, is that Jesus bothers himself with people's real problems. How many of you have real problems in your life? Let's all raise our hands together because we know we do. Good. If you didn't raise your hand, your problem is lying. So we're good. Right? But we've all got real problems. And I want you to know that in, in the miracle stories, although, although the, the temporal thing isn't the main thing, Jesus still handles and deals with and helps people in their real world problems. And it's interesting in, in this story that, that Jesus helps people who don't even know that they need help. Right? Sometimes Jesus helps people and they don't even know that they need it. Who was Jesus' audience in this particular story? It wasn't the bride, who's the star of every wedding, as we know. It wasn't the bridegroom. It wasn't the parents of the bride. It wasn't the parents of the groom. His audience wasn't even the head caterer. His audience wasn't all of the people in the town of Cana who had come and gathered. You see, Jesus had a capacity crowd gathered, and he could have shown himself off to all of those people in that moment, and he chose not to. Who was his crowd? Who were the people that knew what happened? Probably five or six of his disciples who were there with him, his mother, and the caterers. Not only if you go to weddings, but the caterers aren't the star of the show. The caterers are the people who are supposed to be in the background. They're the people that are supposed to be out back cooking the food and bringing it in and not being seen, and hopefully they have some nice clothes on 
And then they come in and, and they provide the food and they, they take off. They're not the stars of the show. And that was Jesus' audience. Jesus bothers himself with people's real problems. Sometimes those people don't even know that Jesus is helping them out. And even related to that is Jesus in this situation, like he so often does, provides salvation from a, a shameful situation. These people didn't know that they were going to be shamed. These people didn't know that the bridegroom had no idea that the wine was about to run out. But Jesus provides salvation from a shameful time, a shameful situation, and they don't even know it. It's interesting as you think about the, the master of ceremonies, the head caterer coming up to the groom and talking to the groom, and you think what that conversation could have looked like. Had Jesus not been on the guest list, had Jesus not been there, or had Jesus chosen not to bother himself with people's real problems, what would that conversation have looked like? I think the look on the head caterer's face would have been a little bit different. It wasn't, he wasn't carrying a glass that had good wine in it. He would have been carrying an empty glass. And he would have been calling the groom over in a state of panic as opposed to in a state of joy. And he would have looked at the groom and he would have said, we don't have any more wine. What are we going to do? And then his panic would have been transferred to the groom and the groom would have been panicked. And then all of that shame and all of that disgrace and as people were going back for more wine and there was no more wine to be had, suddenly throughout this whole crowd, people would have been realizing something's bad, something's wrong, something's amiss. There's a problem here. And Jesus saves them from all of that shame. And I don't want to push that too far because it's not the point of this story, but it is a subplot. It is part of the story, and it really is how Jesus works. Because I believe that those things are true today, just as they were at that wedding feast, that Jesus bothers himself with people's real problems. That sometimes Jesus is helping us out, and we don't even know it. And he's saving us from, from things, and we don't even know it. And we know that Jesus provides salvation from shame and salvation from disgrace. Amen? That's how Jesus works. One more observation here that I want to be sure to make is that Jesus' temporal blessings are always a means and never an end. I'll say that again. Jesus' temporal blessings, like this provision, an overabundance of wine that probably wasn't even all drank at that particular occasion, and maybe some of it was even used um, by the couple later um, as a wedding gift, right? Jesus, maybe some say he provided a wedding gift through that that they could use in other ways. But Jesus' temporal blessings aren't the end. Jesus didn't show up at the wedding and create the wine and give that to them just so that they would be taken care of. They're always a means and never an end. In all of Jesus' miracles, it's not just about the person who was healed. It's not just about the event of healing. And in our lives, if Jesus gives us temporal blessings... If he gives us temporal blessings here and now, that's not the end in and of itself. That's always a means. And verses 11 and 12 provide the mean, or provide the end. They help us see the motive. Why does Jesus provide blessings? Look at verse 11. It says, This was the first of his signs that Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. There are several things that we could talk about there, but I want you to notice the word signs because we call them miracles usually. But John, I told you this at the beginning of the series, that John specifically talks about the things that Jesus does as signs. Signs point to something bigger than themselves, don't they? If you see a sign and it's not giving you any direction, it's a sign with no point. If you see a sign and it says, warning, bridge out, what is that telling you? Don't go try to ride across the bridge. If you see a sign and it has a speed limit, what does that tell you? Only go five to ten miles faster than what's posted. I get it. Yeah, okay, good. But signs have a point. And I think John uses the terminology of sign to help us understand that when Jesus does these miraculous interventions, that there's a point to them. And the signs always point to Jesus' identity. With this first sign, Jesus begins to reveal who he really is. When it says in verse 11, he manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. Manifesting his glory is something that Jesus does. And this will help you understand the title of the sermon. This is something that Jesus does 
kind of like turning up a dimmer switch. I think that for some of us, we get the idea that the way that Jesus manifests himself and shows his identity and reveals himself to people would be as if I walked back there and turned off all of these lights and it was completely dark and I just flipped them all on and it was completely light. And the people come to know Jesus and get to know Jesus and develop a relationship with Jesus and Jesus identifies himself all the time just like a light switch. And boom, I saw the light and it was on. In the Gospel of John, Jesus is revealing himself like a dimmer switch. And you turn the dimmer switch on and you can barely see. You turn it up a tiny bit more and you see a little bit more. And as you continue to turn up the dimmer switch, you continue to get to know more about Jesus. That's why Jesus didn't do this miracle and let everybody at the wedding feast know about it. His hour had not yet come. That's why John presents the miracles that he does of Jesus in the sequence that he does in John's Gospel because John is turning up the dimmer switch for us, giving us enough Jesus that we can understand some, and then some more, and then some more, and then some more, so we continue to get a fuller picture of Jesus. And turning up the dimmer switch in our understanding of Jesus is what John's gospel is all about. And then at the end of verse 11, it says his disciples believed in him. That belief, John chapter 20, verse 31, these things are written so that you may what? Believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and by believing you may have life in his name. And John is showing us exhi exhibit A of how his purpose statement comes to fruition and comes about. I added verse 12 this week because I, I think it's an interesting verse and it's kind of like a, it's a travel log verse. It just tells you where, how they got from one place to the next place. And if you look at verse 13 and following, it kind of doesn't seem to fit. And you think, why is verse 12 even there? So it says, after this, he went down to Capernaum with his mother and his brothers and his disciples, and they stayed there for a few days. Well, that's a, a weird verse, because the next thing we know, he's going to be in Jerusalem, and he's going to be throwing things, and that's going to be a fun sermon next week. Please don't miss that one, right? <laughs> but why would John put that verse there? After Jesus did this great miracle and saved this couple, and they didn't even know it, and he, and he turned the water into wine, and that was a really cool thing. Why does it seem like he just takes off and leaves and go takes a few days of vacation? I believe that Jesus is letting things settle down here. His hour has not yet come. He's not looking for a horde of followers who are just excited about him because of what he can do for them. He's not looking, about, looking to just gather a bunch of fans. What Jesus really wants is followers. And so I believe that he lets things settle down. Because if you really believe in something, you'll still be there when the spectacular things settle down. If those, if those disciples, if those followers of Jesus really believed in Jesus, they will still be there when the spectacular settles down. When the big news and the exciting news and the wow, look at that, when the wow factor is gone, that's when you know who's really following Jesus. For so many people today, they follow Jesus because he gets them into something they want or out of something that they don't want. And as soon as they're out of it or into it, they forget all about Jesus. When the spectacular settles down, they're nowhere to be found. I did not do that on purpose. Somebody write it down. When the spectacular settles down, people are nowhere to be found. But at the end of the day, people who truly believe and truly follow Jesus, they're still there. That's most of you here today have been Christians for 20, 30, 40. Bruce said he was a Christian for 47 years, right? And day in and day out. And we're there through the spectacular and through the everyday. And that's why Jesus adds that to show that his disciples are there when it settles down. So let's, let's bring, this, bring this home. What is this going to teach us and show us? You know, there are some interesting secondary level kind of things that, that are going on in this story. Uh, we don't want to miss them, but we don't want to make too much of them. Many people see the fact that Jesus performs his first miracle at a wedding feast um, as symbolic and as pointing forward to the messianic banquet uh, at the end of time, the, the marriage supper of the Lamb, as it's called. Some people see those ritual purification jars and say that Jesus is bringing fullness to religious experience as he fills those purification jars and uses them for a different purpose, that Jesus is foreshadowing something, even in that. An interesting one, even in the use of wine, if you look at some of the Old Testament prophets, they actually prophesy, Amos especially, 
uh, and a little bit in Jeremiah that the, the messianic age, the age that the Jewish people were looking for, was an age that, that would um, be signified by an abundance of wine, an overflowing wine, and that was an abundance of joy and hope and blessing. And some people think that in Jesus in doing this miracle is actually pointing forward to all of those things and all of those symbols. Here's what I know is happening in this story. As Jesus reveals his true identity, those who followed him, truly followed him, were continuing to firm up their belief in him. Jesus turns up his identity, turns up the dimmer switch on his identity, and as he reveals himself more and more and more, those who follow him, who struggle with believing in him, continue to firm up their belief in him. That's what should happen for us today. If you're here today and you're not a Christian and you say, like, the switch is off. First of all, you know, if you've been here before, we're glad you're here. This is a place where hopefully we can help you search for answers. You know, I don't know if I can turn on the dimmer switch for you and help you to even start to maybe see some things about Jesus, but I'd love to talk with you. I'd love to point you in, in the right direction and maybe we can search together. So if you're, if you're not sure about Jesus or you've heard a lot of things about Jesus that you don't agree with or maybe you've heard a lot of conflicting things about Jesus or maybe you heard things about Jesus and then you saw people who, who said that they love Jesus act a completely different way than what you heard about Jesus, like I'm really happy that you're here. And I want to help you search for Jesus. And maybe just kind of turn on the dimmer switch and get started. If that's you, man, talk to me. I'll be right here after the service. Pastor Lauren will be at the back door. Just come up and say, hey, we'd lo I'd love to grab a cup of coffee. Because that's the best way to talk about Jesus. Amen? A cup of coffee. So do that. For the rest of us who are Christians, the dimmer switch never stops going up. Do you understand that? I don't get to this place in my Christian life where I'm like, well, the dimmer switch is all the way on and I know everything there is to know about Jesus. I've studied and read God's, John's gospel many times before and new things as I'm studying and reading now, like more and more and more new exciting things, the dimmer switch should always be going up and getting a brighter picture of Jesus. And then you know what happens to your faith and your belief? It should be getting stronger. So continue to turn up the dimmer switch on your understanding of Jesus. One of the very specific ways, as I end, that we've had you doing that is by taking the passage for next week's sermon, reading it ahead of time, and spending some time studying on your own throughout the week. So on the screen behind me is next week's sermon passage. It's when Jesus cleanses the temple. It's a great one. It's going to be really fun. But it'll be even better if you spend some time on your own this week studying that. There are study materials available on the Connect table, also available on the homepage of our website online to give you some guidance and studying on your own. But allow God's word to continue to turn up the dimmer switch on the identity of Jesus, no matter how long you've known him.